أوله أو قل فيه ربي أعلم. Okay, so he says, and everything that has come down by way of revelation in the Quran or in Hadith, uh, with, um, um, with an expression, with an expression that creates the illusion, yuhimu, creates the illusion of likeness between God and creation, awilhu, interpret it. Aw, or say about it, my Lord knows best what it means. So this is very important and we'll stop here. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this and we'll end here. But this is really important. Okay, so again, we're talking about what is possible about God. And God speaks about himself with infinite wisdom. So he says, for example, I am closer to him than his juggler vein, which you asked about. And he also said, the most merciful has taken the throne. What, like me? This chair is bigger than I am. So the throne is bigger than God? Or does the throne squeak when God sits in it? And where was God when the throne wasn't created? Okay, but Allah says that. He says, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. God has taken the throne. And Allah speaks about the hand of God. And Allah speaks about the eye of God. And Allah speaks about the ear. And he speaks in the hadith about the foot. The Jabbar puts his foot in the fire. And he speaks about coming down to the first heaven in the last third of the night. And you can go on, right? There are many references like that. So these verses are what we call mutashabihat. They are mutashabihat. These are verses that create likenesses, apparent likenesses. Apparent likenesses between what? Between God and creation. Between God and man. The human being. Okay? And so therefore, any verse that comes down in the Quran or the Hadith that speaks of God in terms that are similar to his creation or that are similar to human beings, that speak of him moving, speaking, speak of him being, coming down in the heavens and so forth, <clears throat> you do one of two things. Awilhu, you interpret it correctly, according to the basic principles of the theology. So, for example, the Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the hearts are between uh, the hearts are between two fingers of the Most Merciful. He turns them over however he wills." How would you interpret that? Our scholars say, "Will and power." The two fingers here are will and power. That your heart is between the will and power of God. He turns it over however he wants. Okay, you can interpret. And sometimes it's necessary to interpret. Because some people, they say that, no, I want to know what this means. It's problematic for me. Um, the most merciful assumed the throne. One of our great sheikhs, he said, had God said, the Jabbar took the throne, then all creation would melt. So the verse is very meaningful, and it means that God rules this world in the name of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. That mercy is the stamp of his creation, not punishment, not justice, not compelling power, but mercy. It's very meaningful. Okay, so any time that you see that, do not interpret those verses in a way that overthrows the definitive principles of the faith. Okay, this is very important. And that's why in the Quran, Allah says in uh, Surat Ali Imran, the third surah, right? This very, very interesting verse. هو الذي أنزل الكتاب منه آيات محكمات هن أم الكتاب وأخر متشابهات فأما الذين في قلوبهم زيغ فيتبعون ما تشابه منه. Okay, so he says that he, God, no other, is the one who sent down the book. Of it, there are verses that are أمهات. They are foundational. 
They are the mothers of the book. They are the foundation of the book. They are the core principles. God is one. Nothing is like unto God. Nothing is his peer. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the one who begins creation. He is the one who sustains creation. Okay, these are absolutely clear. They're not open to interpretation. They are the foundation of the revelation. Book here is revelation. Okay. And there are other verses, mutashabihat, in which likenesses are drawn. In other words, they speak of God in terms that you could confuse as being like you. You have a hand, he has a hand. You have an eye, he has an eye. You have a foot, it speaks of his foot. Okay, you sit in a chair, he's spoken of as assuming the throne. Uh, you are inside things and outside things. And there are verses that may speak of him as that way too. Uh, you move and you're still. And there are verses that speak of him as moving, coming down to the, to the first heaven. Okay, so do not interpret those verses. Is as for those in whose hearts there is deviation, they follow matashabahaminhu. They follow the verses that have the similarities. Okay, so they will think of God as a man. They will think of God as bound in time and place, and we don't do that. We don't do that. And this is extremely important because why then did Allah in the Quran and in the Hadith of the Prophet and from what we know in every other revelation before speak of himself in categorical terms and speak of himself also in mutashabihat? Why? Why didn't he just not do that? And that's because the mutashabihat contain the arch secrets. They are among the most meaningful of all verses, but very few people can understand them. And to be able to understand them, you have to know the structure of reality. And to know the structure of reality, you have to know that reality has different stages. And to know that, you have to also be able to see things upside down and inside out. Can you do that? I have a hard time doing that. Okay, and then you can begin to see that these verses are extremely meaningful. They're extremely, but we never interpret them in a way to overturn our basic beliefs. This is really, really important. So he says, Either interpret it or say about it, my Lord knows best what it means. So you have two positions. One of them is that you interpret soundly. You say that this means that God has dominion over creation, like a king in a throne, metaphorically, and that he rules creation as a merciful Lord. Okay, that's a good interpretation. Nothing wrong with that. All right. And so you either interpret, and usually we have to get our interpretations from scholars who have really done this carefully, or say, my Lord knows best. In other words, like, I believe in this, and I do not know what it means. My Lord knows best what it means. And I do not take it literally. Okay, because if you took it literally, you interpreted. And you interpreted it in a way that overturns the basic structure of belief. So we don't believe that God is a man. We don't believe that he has sideburns. We don't believe that he has a beard. We don't believe that he has a certain distance between in his face and like a lot of Jews believe that for sure. They have a book called Shi'ur Qoma. Shi'ur Qoma. You know, Shi'ur Qoma means Miqyas um, Al Qama. Shi'ur, Shi'ar Al Qama. Shi'ur Qoma means Miqyas Al Qama. That how tall is God? And what is the distance between his eyes? And how long are his sideburns? Because, you know, Jews, they have to wear the sideburns, right? So God has sideburns too. He looks like a rabbi. They portray him that way. That's kufr. How long are his sideburns? How big are his ears? How big are his hands? Kufr, kufr, kufr. Okay, we don't do that. We don't do that. And uh, so here we have two schools. 
Okay, we have one school, they're both Sunni schools, but one of them is the school of interpretation. And this is the school of Imam al-Ash'ari and Imam al-Maturidi. And it is called Madhab al-Khalaf. It's called the school of the moderns, because they lived about 300 years, 400 years after the Prophet. So they're modern people, right? They lived uh, 1,000 some years ago, but we call them the moderns. And they interpreted because it was an imperative to do so. Because many people were taking this literally and many people were interpreting it in far out ways. So they said that we've got to interpret. And then you have the other school which is called Madhab al-Salaf. And this is the school of the early generations, the companions, the successors, the successors of the successors, and they did not interpret. But they knew what it meant, just as the great masters of the way know what it means. And they will give you secrets out of these verses that you could not imagine. And this is fatih, this is an opening. And you have to understand this, the companions were not Bedouins. The companions were not simple people. The companions were people who were the greatest knowers of Allah who ever lived. They took the light of the Prophet from him. They understood things from him by the mere sounds of his speech and looking at him and touching him and smelling his fragrance. So they understood these things. And it's not like that, well, we don't know what this means. No, no. They knew what it meant. But what it means cannot be said in words. What it means is, cannot be said in words. And Imam Malik was like that. He follows the way of the Salaf. That's why when a man came to Medina, he stood up and he said, Ar-Rahmanu al-Arsh istawa. Like, what does this mean? Like, this is absurd. How can that be? Allah is not like anything. You mean to say he's like a king? He's sitting on his throne? So he says, Ar-Rahmanu al-Arsh istawa. Tell me about that, Imam Malik. Imam Malik said, Al-Istiwa'u ghayru majhul. He said, taking the position on the throne, the word is not unknown. We know what that word means. You do too. Well, kayfu ghayru ma'qul. But the how of it is not, to be, is not to be perceived by the intellect. Okay, don't think that he is a human being sitting on a throne. Well, kayfu ghayru ma'qul. That's powerful. See, the kayf, the how of this, is not to be perceived by the intellect alone. Well, imanu bihi wajib, and to believe in it is obligatory. Was su'alu anhu bid'ah, and asking about it is an innovation. He said, wa ana araka mubtadi'an, and I see you, I believe you're an innovator. Uh, Imam Malik is very tough, very strong. Most people couldn't speak in his presence. You know, uh, one of the great Egyptian scholars who came to Medina, Ibn Wahab, Ibn al-Qasim, uh, I think it's, it's either, it's one or the other. Ibn al-Wahab was the greatest scholar of Egypt. He came to Imam Malik, he stayed with him for 30 years until he died. Ibn al-Qasim came to him and stayed for 20 years until Imam Malik died. They were the greatest scholars of Egypt. Ibn al-Qasim came in the Egyptian delegation, as did Ibn Wahab 10 years before. And the Egyptian delegation told him, you have to ask certain questions. And one of them is about a hermaphrodite. Is the hermaphrodite a male or a female? Okay, very important because it affects inheritance, for example. And other things as well. Okay, so, and he said, I could never ask Imam Malik that question. I never, in 20 years, he could never ask that question. And in the Mudawana, which, you know, is one of the great books. You can see Ibn al-Qasim even says that there. He says, we never asked Imam Malik that question, and nobody ever dared ask it. Even though it's a standard fiqh question. But he said, I believe that you should consider how the hermaphrodite urinates. So if the hermaphrodite urinates as a female, it's a female. And if the hermaphrodite urinates, urinates like a male, it's a male. He said, that's my answer. That's how I work it out. But he said, none of us ever asked Imam Malik that. Because Imam Malik was very, he looked like Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he sat in the place of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he, he inspired great awe. 
But again, this was their position, that these things, okay, any time that Allah speaks of himself in a way that is similar to creation, then we either interpret it soundly on the basis of our principles of theology, or we turn it over to Allah. We say, I believe in this, and I don't know fully what it means, but you don't take it literally. That's very important. You don't take it literally. Um, before we uh, finish, we maybe can take your question in a minute, but before we finish, um, this is a re really important issue. In, in our religion, we have certain hadith, certain verses, which are absolutely clear. They are the foundation of the religion. We don't ever disagree on those. And then we have many other verses and hadith that are open to interpretation. Among them are the mutashabihat, those verses and hadith that speak of God in ways that are similar to the way we speak of creation. Okay, so never, and then you have other verses, you have legal hadith. Most legal hadith can be interpreted two or three or more different ways, validly. That's why we have schools of law. Because schools of law have methodologies for soundly interpreting these hadith and verses. They don't do it arbitrarily. It's like, I have a particular way I interpret these hadith or these verses. This is really important. We don't ever spill the cart. Okay, so uh, in these verses, he, God, is the one who sent down the book. In it, there are verses of clear, concise, undebatable meaning. They are the foundation of the book. When was that verse revealed? It was revealed in Medina. And it was revealed according to some transmissions, some sound transmissions, when the delegation of Najran came to Medina. The delegation of Najran was the biggest delegation that ever came to Medina. And the delegation of Najran was a Christian delegation coming from southern western Arabia, Najran. And they had among them Trinitarians and they had Unitarians. They had different Christians. Okay, and they came to see the Prophet and the Trinitarians tried to use the Quran and it's mutashabihat to show that God is three and one. That why does Allah say we? Isn't that three? Isn't that the Trinity? So they would do that. And when they did that, Allah revealed the first 70 verses of Ali Imran. And in them are, are this pivotal verse. He is the one who sent down the book, the revelation. In it, there are verses of definite meaning. And there are others that are similar. They speak in ways of similitudes with creation and, uh, and so forth. And this was part of the response to the Christians, but that's extremely interesting historically. Because again, in the history of the Christian church,